American launch vehicle companies Astraspace and Firefly Aerospace suffered anomalies during their launch attempts last week. Astra, now a public company, ran into a problem during its first commercial launch on August 28. Its launch vehicle, Rocket 3.3, ignited its five first-stage Delphin engines at liftoff time on the pad in Alaska. But instead of immediately ascending vertically, the rocket tipped and moved sideways, hovering just about the ground. It took nearly 20 seconds for the sideways motion to stop, at which point the rocket started to ascend. The 13 meters tall launch vehicle was carrying a test payload for the U.S. Department of Defense's space test program. That payload was a mass simulator, not an operational satellite, so it was not meant to be deployed. Despite the initial wobble and sideways list, the rocket did manage to climb to a maximum altitude of around 50 kilometers before the company issued a shutdown command. The mission was terminated right around max Q, the point when the mechanical stresses on a rocket are highest. A camera mounted on the launch vehicle appeared to show a piece of the booster breaking loose around that time. The rocket crashed into the ocean downrange from Kodiak Island, causing no damage or injury to the public. An immediate call about 90 minutes after the failure, Chris Kemp, co-founder and chief executive of Astra said that one of the five first stage engines failed less than a second after liftoff, and the team is still looking into why that happened. The guidance system was able to maintain control, and the rocket began flying horizontally for a few seconds until we burned off enough propellants to begin resuming with our liftoff, he added. The launch was Astra's third attempt to reach orbit in less than a year, all of which failed. Astra has scheduled a second demonstration launch for the U.S. Space Force in October of this year. Firefly Aerospace's first launch of its Alpha rocket ended in failure on September 2, when the rocket exploded two and a half minutes after liftoff. Firefly's Alpha rocket launched on the company's first-ever orbital test flight on Thursday, lifting off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, aiming to send a payload of tiny private satellites to space at no charge to the owners. The vehicle was supposed to reach the speed of Mach 167 seconds after liftoff, followed by maximum aerodynamic pressure nine seconds later. However, launch controllers did not report that the vehicle was supersonic until two minutes and 20 seconds after liftoff going to be a huge milestone. Vehicle is supersonic. Ten seconds later, the rocket began swinging to the side, tipped horizontally, and then exploded. It appears that one of the rocket's four Reaver engines misbehaved during the flight leading to the anomaly. Alpha experienced an anomaly during the first stage ascent that resulted in the loss of the vehicle, Fireflight weeded. In a separate statement, Space Launch Delta 30 at Vandenberg said it terminated the launch. Both the company and the Space Force said there were no injuries, although there are eyewitness accounts of debris from the rocket falling in the town. Firefly said it is too early to know what caused the mishap and that the company will be diligent in their investigation with the Space Force and the Federal Aviation Administration. According to Firefly, it achieved several key mission objectives despite the explosion, including a successful first-stage ignition, clean liftoff from the pad, and progression to supersonic speed. The mission also generated test flight data that will help the company move forward with the rocket's testing and development. According to a recent report, the Federal Aviation Administration will not allow Virgin Galactic to resume flights of its Spaceship 2 suborbital spaceplane until it completes an investigation into a problem on the vehicle's crewed flight in July. While the July 11th mission was completed with no injuries to staff or crew, including the company's billionaire founder Richard Branson, it was recently uncovered that the spaceplane deviated its trajectory outside of cleared airspace. During the flight, a red warning light came on the spaceplane's dashboard, indicating that it went off its planned trajectory. The spaceplane flew off course for a total of 1 minute and 41 seconds ignoring the entry glide cone warning, the FAA said. In a September 1 statement, Virgin Galactic blamed high winds at upper altitudes for the deviation in the trajectory that triggered the warning. The company added that, although the flight's ultimate trajectory deviated from the initial plan, the ship did not fly outside of the lateral confines of the protected airspace, and at no time did the ship travel above any population centers or cause a hazard to the public. However, hours before the FAA statement, Virgin Galactic announced plans for its next Spaceship 2 flight. The Unity 23 flight will be a dedicated flight for the Italian Air Force, carrying three Italian researchers and one Virgin Galactic employee in the cabin. The flight will be piloted by Michael Masucci and CJ Sterko, and the company is targeting a flight window in late September or early October of this year. But the FAA did not disclose when it expected to give its approval for the company to resume flights. Starlink and other satellite internet providers can't easily sneak internet access into repressive countries with their permission because the technical and legal challenges are too difficult. 
but a new generation of Starlink satellites may solve some of those problems, allowing the internet to slip past iron curtains. SpaceX is rolling out Gen 2 Starlink satellites that are equipped with optical laser communications, which have higher throughput than radio transmissions. If it works, the satellites will be able to link directly to each other more efficiently. That in turn means that, instead of needing a ground station a few hundred miles away, a user could have their data sent back and forth through the Starlink network to a ground station anywhere. With laser interconnects, SpaceX only has to ship a user their pizza box-sized terminal to provide them with an internet connection. If the system is up in four to six months, as Musk promises, dissidents could potentially be able to log into the global communications network to share their stories. With the Taliban taking control over Afghanistan in recent days, there is increasing international concern over how they could control internet access. Also, the Taliban has reportedly started destroying antennas and other communications infrastructure in Afghanistan. The major challenge to delivering the internet without permission is the legal rules for transmitting radio signals inside a given country. At least superficially, eliminating ground stations eliminates these countries' political leverage, and Starlink can easily deliver internet services to countries like Afghanistan. When asked what Taliban or governments in these countries could do to cut off Starlink access, Musk says they can shake their fist at the sky. A former Navy intelligence officer, Lila Kahistani, told CNN that she would love it if SpaceX could flood Afghanistan with Starlink so that there is a way for the US to maintain communication with their Afghan partners. Meanwhile, after Amazon asked the Federal Communications Commission to dismiss SpaceX's latest amendment to its Gen 2 Starlink satellite network, SpaceX filed a response with the FCC and said Amazon's move was just the latest in its continuing efforts to slow down the competition. According to SpaceX, Amazon is purposefully trying to delay proposals for its Starlink satellite internet service because Amazon still can compete with its own satellite solution, Kuiper Systems. SpaceX wrote that Amazon has not updated the FCC in nearly 400 days on Kuiper's approach to interference and orbital debris, but took only four days to object to the SpaceX Gen 2 amendment. SpaceX said it provided two potential configurations for the next-generation Starlink deployment because plans could change depending on the timing of development of the satellites and launch vehicle, for which SpaceX has exercised radical transparency. Musk emphasized his company's response that Bezos is exceptionally litigious and filing legal actions against SpaceX is actually his full-time job. NASA announced on Thursday that the Perseverance Mars rover has snagged its first-ever Red Planet sample on September 1, apparently socking away a drilled-out core of a rock dubbed Richette. Perseverance's sampling and caching system uses a rotary percussive drill and a hollow coring bit at the end of its 2-meter-long robotic arm to extract samples slightly thicker than a pencil. The target for the sample collection attempt was a briefcase-size rock belonging to a ridgeline that is more than 900 meters long and contains rock outcrops and boulders. The initial images downlinked after the historic event show an intact sample present in the tube after coring. After taking these images, the rover conducted a procedure called Perkis to ingest, which vibrated the drill bit and tube to clear the lip of the sample tube of any residual material. The action also caused samples to slide down farther into the tube. The sampling attempt on Thursday was the second for Perseverance, which also made a sampling attempt on August 5. But the rocket drill turned out to be surprisingly soft, crumbling into bits that didn't make it into the designated tube. Perseverance will get a lot of sample snagging practice over the coming weeks and months. The six-wheeled robot carries 43 sampling tubes, and team members have said they aim to fill at least 20 of them before the mission is done. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. At the launch site, pre-flight work continues on Starship 20, and SpaceX employees are working full-time to prepare the ship for its orbital test flight. Raptor engines of the ship arrived at the launch site on September 5. The engines that arrived on Sunday were the ship's sea level engines, with serial numbers 73, 78 and 69. Super Heavy Booster 4 is still inside the high bay, where teams are working to finish its secondary plumbing and avionics. Even though intermittent road closures are scheduled for this week, we are not sure when Booster 4 will be rolled out to the launch site. Maybe SpaceX is waiting for the works on the orbital launch mount to be completed before the transport of Booster 4. A 10,000 feet temporary flight restriction has been issued on August 31 covering areas surrounding Starbase. The TFR began on September 1 and will continue till September 30. The newly issued flight restriction above the Starship facility indicates that we are nearing towards Starship and booster ground tests. 
Furthermore, last month, SpaceX submitted an FCC application seeking approval to operate Starlink during ground tests and orbital flight of Starship. They request permission to operate the terminal starting on September 16 through March 2022. The timeframe suggests we could see a Starship fly to orbit as soon as late September or early October if SpaceX receives regulatory approval from all federal agencies. But it's almost impossible to say when FAA could complete environmental reviews and grant SpaceX a launch license. Recently, Elon Musk stated that SpaceX could attempt to catch a super-heavy booster out of mid-air as early as Starship's second orbital launch attempt. The second orbital launch attempt will feature Super Heavy Booster 5, whose parts were recently spotted at the production site. During the orbital test flight, the vehicle will lift off from the orbital launch pad Stage 0, which includes the 145 meters tall orbital launch tower. The tower will be equipped with mechanical arms to stack the spacecraft atop the booster and catch the vehicle as it returns from space. Elon Musk calls the launch tower's mechanical arm system Mechazilla, and according to him, SpaceX will try to catch the largest ever flying object with robot chopsticks. He added that success is not guaranteed, but excitement is. When a Twitter user asked how Mechazilla will catch the booster, Musk explained that booster has two pins for lifting and catching, although maybe it's better to modify grid fins of the booster to take more load. He also has plans to catch the Starship with the same tower arm instead of attempting a propulsive landing when the ship returns from space. In his opinion, some kind of mechanism should be designed to flip out from the leeward side of the top of the ship to act as load points during the catching attempt. He added that SpaceX has not yet finalized such a system, but maybe it will be a part of the forward flaps, or probably not. In short, such a catching mechanism would eliminate the need for the ship to have landing legs, thus eliminating the risk of a landing failure. When asked how will the arms slide the booster back out to line up with the orbital pad, Musk responded the tank treads will be installed on the tower arms to move the booster horizontally before lowering the vehicle onto the pad. Tank Treader Continuous Track is a system of vehicle propulsion usually used in track vehicles like army tanks or bulldozers. Running on a continuous band of treads or track plates driven by two or more wheels, such a system on the tower arms will allow SpaceX to easily roll the booster back and forth as needed. We have some latest updates related to the Dear Moon Project, a lunar tourism mission and art project conceived and financed by Japanese billionaire Yusaku Mizawa, in partnership with SpaceX. The mission will make use of a starship on a private spaceflight, flying a circumlunar trajectory around the moon, carrying Mizawa and eight other people selected through the Dear Moon contest. In July, Dear Moon released a teaser video featuring some of the contestants who could potentially win the flight to space. The video featured a diverse group of people with a variety of talents and aspirations. On Tuesday, August 31, Dear Moon project representatives announced they already selected the finalists that could ride SpaceX's first crewed Starship flight, and the candidates have now all completed a medical checkup, the final step of the selection process. However, they did not disclose who the finalists are, nor how many made it to the final round of the selection process. The mission that was unveiled in September 2018 is expected to launch no earlier than 2023. Moving on to other Starship updates, on August 31, SpaceX employees moved ground support equipment tank number 7 to the launch site on a self-propelled modular transporter. On the same day, the GSE test tank that successfully completed a cryo-proof test on August 25 was moved back to the build site. This marks the end of an experimental campaign begun to validate the construction methods used for GSE tanks. The next day, on September 1, the GSE Tank 7 was lifted with the help of a crane and placed on the tank farm. For those unfamiliar, made up of stainless steel, GSE tanks are Starship-derived propellant storage tanks that stores propellants required for orbital flights. One more GSE tank, Tank No. 8, is currently under construction at the build site. On September 3, a cryo shell was rolled out to the launch site, which will be lifted and mounted over a GSE tank in the coming days. Later workers will fill the gap between them with an insulating material to reduce the boil-off rate. Three more cryo shells are currently being assembled at the build site. The tank farm now consists of six GSE tanks, out of which two were sleeved, one water tank, and a methane tank shell. On August 29, SpaceX installed a quick disconnect arm on the fifth segment of the orbital launch tower. The arm connects power and fuel lines to the Starship before liftoff. And recently, an aerial flyover by RGV Aerial Photography spotted parts of the quick disconnect arm extension lying next to the launch tower. The arm extension has a claw-like structure attached to its end. The claw may possibly be for bracing booster to steady the vehicle during Starship stacking. 
The extension will be attached to the end of the already installed QD arm in the coming weeks. Work on the booster catching arm is in progress, and new parts of the catching arm were delivered to the launch site last week. Although protests from Blue Origin delayed works on SpaceX's lunar human landing system, SpaceX seems to be actively recruiting engineers for their HLS program. Recently a job notification for a life support systems engineer for Crew Starship appeared on the SpaceX website. The key responsibilities of the post include the design and development of the environmental and thermal control systems aboard Crew Starship for lunar missions. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.